That's a great question. <laughs> I played all the sports because I was pretty terrible at most of them. I think I played everything except for basketball and golf. So um, it's interesting. I was pretty down on myself uh, when I was here about my lack of ability to excel in any one individual sport. It turns out what has made me successful in my current career is actually the ability to do a variety of things and learn them very quickly. So I had started working on that skill here. I just didn't realize it, but itself is a superpower. So that's the sports side. On the class side, my favorite class was always any class where I was interacting. So Mr. Gleick is here and he hasn't aged a day. I don't know if you all have seen this, this man's genetics, but um, I really enjoyed his class because he always, he understood that we needed to have physical things to interact with when we were doing our science experiments and whatnot. So I really enjoyed that class. Any, anytime I can interact with something, a model, even in my current job, I bring in models and diagrams and corporate strategy to try to solve problems and to get people together. So uh, I think I learned a little, that how to problem solve in that way and how I learn here, um, I apply it now. But physically doing things is important for me. I think something I did, didn't appreciate at all at the time, because um, when you're young, you're very focused on yourself, you know, which is fine. That, that's part of the, the whole human process. But um, I didn't recognize that God is real and that Christ came to earth, God actually came to earth. I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. I had to figure that out through all my combat experiences. Um, so that connection with the spiritual side of things is like the most important thing in my life now. But when I was a student here, I was the most important thing my ego. It took 20 years for some of it to come back and start serving me and helping me become a better version of myself. Uh, where did you grow up and what was life like before the war? Um, uh, I grew up in, uh, born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, when in Afghanistan there were a lot of uh, different governments came like right after another one. Uh, it was not easy, it was uh, like, very hard, and the war um, was uh, very scary. I joined the Marines to be a rebel. My whole family was basically Army and Air Force. Both of my grandfathers were war veterans. And I wanted to do something aggressive. I didn't just want to go sit in college, sit in more classrooms. I wanted to go do something hardcore. And joining the Marine Corps Reserves meant that basically, you know, for the first two semesters of college, I went and did active duty training in California. Awesome. Training in the mountains, fun stuff, lots of trigger time. And then I got to come back and go to college too. So I kind of got the best of both worlds. Um, I wanted to join the military. But I joined the Marines to be a rebel because Everybody else was in the Army and Air Force, so I wanted to, you know, I was a punk. I wanted to one-up everybody. I wanted to one-up my family. Which I think that's, that's the way it is when you're a young man. It's not a bad thing, necessarily. Um, why did I join Enlisted? So my grandfather, who went to West Point, he joined Enlisted first. So I thought, I'm going to be an officer someday. Why not join enlisted, become pretty good, and then when I become an officer, I'll be a really, really solid officer. I had multiple opportunities to switch to officer, and I chose to stay enlisted uh, for three reasons, really. One, enlisted guys get more trigger time. It's just a fact. Sorry, sir. It's just a fact. Um, Enlisted guys also have a much more relaxed culture and environment. When you're an officer, there's a spotlight on you where you can't relax. You have to be perfection. You have to, you can't let your guard down. Everybody in a, in a 60 man platoon is looking at that lieutenant all the time. So you have to be a role all the time. Those of you that know me know that I'm very, uh, how can we put it? Myself, I'm very authentic, I'm very off the cuff. It's hard for me to be the perfect leader all the time. It's just, 
not my personality. So by staying enlisted, I was able to excel and stay out of trouble and be in the mix and get my hands dirty with everybody. I think you uh, learned from Priory that transferred over to the Marines. Vocabulary. Um, I, I noticed that, and I still don't have a great vocabulary, but I noticed that I was really pushed here more than any other place in my life to develop a good vocabulary. The more diverse vocabulary you can have, the better you can explain really difficult concepts to people. And so when I was in the military, one of the reasons I excelled as an enlisted guy is because I was able to problem solve and explain complex things and notice complex things. A lot of that has to do with, if you don't have the vocabulary to explain something complex, like the best way to put it is the way your vocabulary develops or, or, the, or, the, or the, the broadness of your vocabulary is the broadness of your thoughts. Because your thoughts, you're talking to yourself. So the broader your vocabulary, the more you're able to have really complex thoughts and the better you're able to explain those to others in a way that they can understand. So I would say vocabulary. I really want to talk on this because uh, the Americans came there and we were um, like invaded by the terrorists and the American military came to our country to help us and to free our country, <clears throat> to free our women and girls. So um, that was um, something to help ourselves, our country, our, our nation um, have the right to ask uh, their youth to stand up and save their country and to help their country. So um, the Americans helped us, and so they came all the way from America to uh, Afghanistan to help these poor people. So we had to help ourselves. That's why I chose um, to work with the Americans. And yeah, that's the reason. I was on a combat outpost called uh, Camp Tombstone, Camp Shorabak. Um, it's an Afghan army camp. And he was introduced to me. Uh, he was just brought up. I think Captain Bowman, another another guy on my advisory team, brought him over and introduced him to me. And it was very interesting because very rarely in your life do you meet somebody out of the blue, but you feel like you've known them your whole life. And we had that immediately. And I have a theory about this that our souls knew each other before we came here and we planned this, but, you know, I can't prove that. But it was like, when he walked up, I was like, dude, it's been a long time, where you been? But we'd never met before, but we clicked immediately, and just the trust, I guess, you could say the level of trust was really high right out of the gate, and we just were together all the time, so, yeah, we really cared about each other, still do. Uh, they are just a group of people. Um, uh, they're not from like all over Afghanistan, or, or everyone is not included in the. Um, they're just a group of people. Um, I will die, but I will never accept them. <clears throat> um, we don't have any hope from those kind of group people, the people of Afghanistan. Um, um, but we hope that our elders come together and accept each other. Uh, but um, for now, we don't have any hope from that group. We don't accept them. Uh, and no way we can come along uh, with them. Um, well, in 2014, when uh, Hugh left from Hellman, uh, and I remember the day, the hour, um, he said goodbye, I was crying, but he gave me two papers, which were recommendation letters for the uh, special immigration visa to the U.S. Um, well, I became jobless, so I, I was not able to make money, and um, the Americans were leaving. Um, well, the entire 10 years I was with the military people and bases, and whenever I was going home for like three days or a week, um, 
that was like uh, I was not telling everyone I'm going home, and I was able to spend that time with my family. And I was I would I was coming back to like military bases, then I would I would be safe. But since uh, there were no military bases for me anymore, and like I had to spend all the time home, was um, very scary. Um, I was not able to like um, go um, out uh, alone. I, w I would call my two, three friends to go with me to somewhere. I would not get out uh, when it was um, becoming dark. And most of the time, um, I was not like able to stay home. I would visit my sister house, my uncle house, able to come here and, and be free and say, I left everything behind. Yes, but I also didn't see a clear resolution to the war. I still am not sure in Iraq and Afghanistan what the right resolution is. I know that the good we did there lasts, meaning that schools we rebuild, the health care we brought, everybody now has an iPhone, which here is a problem, but there it's actually a good thing because it's allowing them they're behind us, so them having iPhones now, they are being connected to the whole world. They're being, they're allowed, they can learn from their homes. They can see what's going on in the world. Uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, I think it will have lasting impact that they are no longer tied to Taliban leaders to get their news or their information about what, what's going on in the world. Um, even the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda guys are addicted to their iPhones. So it's democratized information. We got seven families out during the evacuation. It was a nightmare. I mean, just an absolute nightmare. The, the, the trauma that those families had to go through at those gates to try to get through was just a horrific refugee situation. Um, and then we've got a bunch of guys there, including uh, Mira Miri, who were there during the suicide bombing. Um, on the 28th of August, and um, he gets, took shrapnel in his face. We told him on WhatsApp to go to that specific gate at that specific time. We kept saying, he kept saying, like, we don't have any water. We've been out here for 24 hours. Like, we have nowhere to go to the bathroom. And we just kept telling him to stay there. This is your chance. Like, you gotta, you gotta wait in line. And then the suicide bomber detonated, and uh, concuss gave him a mere, a mere a concussion his five kids, all concussions, his wife a concussion, and they're still there. They have an approved, they have an approved US visa, but they just don't have a way to get out of Afghanistan. So there's a bunch of our folks that we sponsored that we're friends with that are still stuck over there. It's very sad. Um, it's very sad that they were blown up and they still haven't been able to come here. But he, they're on a list. We work with the State Department and we have a list of our folks that they're slowly getting out one flight at a time. So he is on the list. He's supposed to come out any month now. So we're looking forward to that day. Um, oh, we love it. Um, I say um, this is heaven. America is heaven. Um, for people like me um, to be born, like I was born in Afghanistan, um, that we come here, or the families that we have sponsored, that they are coming here. Uh, this is a heaven for us. Um, the opportunity of working here, the freedom, the peace, um, the freedom that you have here. Um, it's amazing. America is great. Uh, American people are great. Uh, they've been treating uh, us um, just the same as they're treating each other. We have no difference here. Um, we really uh, love it. We really uh, appreciate it. And we really thank America for living or uh, for giving us a second chance to live. Um, and if, I, if, if you was not bringing me here, um, I would be already dead. Uh, absolutely. So this is... Um, um, not uh, second, uh, it, uh, but, but I would say the first life in Afghanistan. Now this is second chance to live in America.
getting to know Americans from every walk of life. You know, my dad, my dad's a surgeon and we lived in nicer parts of St. Louis and the different places we lived in California and Texas. And we, we had an amazing education. Thank you, mom. Um, but being able to really understand how lucky I am. I remember when I was in infantry school, and right after I graduated from high school, the stories I was hearing from my fellow Marines about what they, what their lives had been like, what their parents' lives had been like, and how they ended up in the Marine Corps versus me was very humbling. And it taught me so much about how lucky I am and uh, not, to, not to waste the opportunities, you know. It, it humbled me in, in a great way.